LCC is a North American university, uh, North American style university in, in Lithuania, in the heart of Europe, actually, actually the geographical center of Europe, um, which is visible in the map. Uh, and um, LCC is located on the Baltic coast in Klaipeda, uh, and which is a seaport. It's a small, cozy, uh, small in terms of bigger, uh, maybe cities in, in Europe, but uh, Klaipeda is the third biggest city in Lithuania. Uh, and it's a seaport. Uh, and the, in summer, it becomes a a uh, resort place where we enjoy sun, um, the sea, uh, and uh, young people around us. And we have full campus, and LCC is the only uh, university uh, in Lithuania that has full campus in one location, which we are very proud of. And uh, as I mentioned that LCC is a North American style university, and it's also a liberal arts university, university which is a very um, common uh, um, model of education in the United States. Uh, and it's a very typical uh, university um, in, in the United States. And so we have the same model here in Lithuania. And we are a very international university where more than 70% of all students are coming from 53 different countries. And um, also, um, 60% of all professors are international professors as well. We are a Christian university and, um, and our values and worldviews are based on uh, Christian values, uh, and, but we accept students from different kinds of cultural, religious, faith backgrounds, and we celebrate each culture and we cel celebrate each uh, worldview and uh, we try to um, creates environment which is very um, friendly and unique for everyone. And LCC is fully accredited in EU uh, and recognized worldwide. Um, and it's a very uh, relational university. And you might ask, what that does that mean? Uh, probably it's, it's a unique word for you. But uh, since we're not a big university, we have around 600 students. So we pretty know each other. We know our professors. And we actually have benefits of small size university because we can be in a classroom where there is 20, 15 or 10 students and we can um, ask questions. We can get personal attention from professors. We can engage into discussions, share our own opinions, working groups and, and, and learn and benefit from that kind of interaction a lot. So we have six bachelor degree programs, uh, International Business Administration, Contemporary Communication, uh, which Andrew Jones represents today. And last time we also have uh, Shane, who also is part of the communication department. Uh, we also have English language and literature program, International Relations and Development, Psychology and Theology. And we also have two master programs in International Management and ESOL, Teaching English to speakers of other languages. Now I want to introduce you to uh, our professor um, uh, from communications department, Andrew Jones. Uh, he is beloved uh, um, professor here at LCC and all students love you, Andrew. Uh, so thank you for agreeing to, to share your expertise, to share your uh, thoughts with our prospective students. And I know that some of our even current students you know, cannot get enough uh, of, of knowing more about, um, about persuasion and, and it's not enough to listen to you. Well, so I'll give you now the, the floor. Uh, and I know that our uh, prospective students, I'll say Academy participants are eager uh, to, to listen to you today. Thank you very much, Vidmante. Um, I'm going to see, I should be able to share my screen here, so, yes. Okay, so the, <clears throat> I wanted to begin with just a, a quick um, introduction of myself to let you know who I am and why I'm the one uh, speaking to you this evening. My, my doctorate is from Louisiana State University, one of the southern states in the United States. 
And I studied there in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and it was a lot of fun. It's a, a great place. If you've heard of the state, you've likely heard of New Orleans. Um, recently, they celebrated Mardi Gras, the first time ever they've done this in a socially distanced scenario where people are um, celebrating from the balconies of their homes, the beautiful decorations there. My major field of study, though, was communication studies with an emphasis in rhetoric. And at first, I think a lot of our students, when they arrive at LCC, are curious about what rhetoric means and what rhetoric is. And the simplest definition I'll give you is that it's all about understanding how persuasion works. So today's topic is really in line with that major emphasis of mine. But I also want to share a little bit more about sort of where I come from and how I view the world. And so I studied my minor field is in political theory. And that was looking at a lot of the, the ways that we make arguments in the world. And this is the part that I think is the funniest. <laughs> but my field really brought political theory together with communication studies and rhetoric by looking at the work of Sherlock Holmes. So if you're not familiar with Sherlock Holmes, he's a detective written by Arthur Conan Doyle. And the really fascinating thing about this to me is that Conan Doyle, when he's writing the Sherlock Holmes stories, is not just persuading you through the story that Sherlock Holmes has reached the answer, but he's also trying to persuade you to think about the world in a certain way. That is, to think about the world as if you are the world's first scientific consulting detective. And it's a lot of the way we see the world and how persuasion operates in that world that I was so fascinated by when I was working on uh, my, my doctoral work. So the three research interests that I have, um, the sort of classes that I teach talk about rhetoric of inquiry. So how do we know that we know what we know? <laughs> <laughs> the second is media ecology. Um, I've taught a course for several years called Media Culture in a Digital Age. Um, and in case there are any uh, former students who have joined us today, um, I have my, my copy of Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media on my shelf behind me, um, which may give you nightmares. But for students who are considering coming to LCC, the thing I loved about teaching that class was how we would talk about an idea and come to understand, for example, why TikTok exists the way it exists, how Instagram has shaped the way we interact with the world around us. And it's the tools that come out of that kind of deep philosophical work that have not just the changing the way you're thinking, but also giving you insight into how you interact with the world around you. And it's one of those classes that I love hearing from former students when they send messages um, saying, Dr. Jones, I was in a meeting today and we were talking about something and I was like, oh my gosh, this is just like if we take the tetrad of media effects and it extends this thing and it recalls that thing. I know you don't know what I'm talking about. It's okay. This is part of what taking a course at a liberal arts university is all about. Blending together the deep philosophical context of something with the pragmatic, practical, everyday applications of it. So the last thing that I've looked at is uh, presidential address. I recently wrote an article about uh, Lithuania, actually, looking at how the um, former foreign minister of Lithuania created an argument for Lithuanian independence. And I looked at that through the lens of presidential address and how he uses detective stories or how we can use detective stories to understand the kind of argument that was being made there. So that's a little bit about me to give you kind of some background on how I think about the world and what gives me some qualifications to talk about this, this topic of persuasion, seeking and resisting compliance. Today, we're going to take a heuristic approach to seeking and resisting compliance. This field of study is a mixture of a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of different social science fields come together here from economics with behavioral economics to psychology with the psychology of group and decision-making to communication, my field, where we talk about persuasion through a dual process model. So I'm going to give you a lot of information right up front. I'm gonna give you a complex model. I'm going to give you a series of nested hypotheses and this is going to be the reach at the beginning. And the reason I'm giving you a reach at the beginning is because I respect you as intellectuals who are here to understand your world a little bit better. 
But then I want to take that really complex model, that nested series of hypotheses, and try to break them down into something you would see every day. So that's where we get to the seeking and resisting compliance. Overall, we're talking about persuasion, but we're talking about a particular approach to persuasion that's a little bit more scientific and technical. And with that, let's get started. In the 1980s, um, there were two theorists working out of the University of Ohio, um, Petty and Cassiopo, and they were building on some work from a, a guy named Chaikin from the 1980s, a little bit earlier than their time. And what they were trying to understand is how it is that human beings make decisions. How do we come to be persuaded? They built their ideas on some work that was current in the day that was coming out of social psychology, and behavioral economics, it's the early days of that field. And they proposed this nested series of hypotheses. So H1, multiple factors influence how much people think about aspects of their interactions. All that means is a lot of things are going on around you all the time. And a lot of those things influence what decision you'll make. So features of the source, recipient, message, and context become particularly important, right? What does that mean? Well, it means that the person who's talking to you, um, who you are, the message that's being communicated, and the context in which that message is being communicated all impact the aspects of your interaction. Now, if you were to break this down into very simple language, it would be obvious. But part of what a researcher does is they use technical language not to make things complicated needlessly, but to make things very specific. So we're not talking about everything everywhere. We're talking about this very specific context. All right, so that's hypothesis one. Multiple factors influence how much people think about aspects of their interactions. H2, your second hypothesis, is that message content has the strongest potential effect on outcomes when recipients process that content systematically and extensively. Oh my gosh, what does that mean? <laughs> All that means is that the message content, so what you're saying, has the strongest effect when you think about the content. Where does that happen? But that happens in, in classrooms, for example. When you're listening to a professor who's talking to you, when you're listening to your teacher explaining an assignment, any time that you're sitting down and thinking, what is this person saying and why are they saying it? Content is the strongest influence. So when recipients think little about message content, so when you're not in a situation where the content is the most important to you, other elements of the situation trigger heuristics that may influence recipient outcomes, All right? Now, what does that mean? What that means is that when you're not thinking about the content of the message, so for example, you're not in a classroom listening to your teacher, you're just walking down the street. Heuristics, which are features of the source, the recipient, the message, and the context, may influence outcomes. So where might we see this? Well, let's pause for a moment and look at hypothesis three. Message recipients are more likely to extensively process content when they possess both the motivation and ability to do so. OK, let's take all three of these hypotheses and try to fit them together a little bit. And I'll give you a common sense explanation. Overall. When we talk about dual process theories of persuasive communication, all we're saying is that when you sit down and think about a message you've received, then the content is the most important. But if you're not really sitting down to think, you're not paying close attention, then it's the other things around you that are going to influence whether you are persuaded or not, whether or not you comply with the request. So how does this work in our everyday lives? Well. At first, researchers tried to find every single heuristic device that was out there, all the things that influence us to make a decision. They first came up with a list of 12 items, 
and then it grew to 25 items, 82, 96, 143 was the largest I've seen so far. But overall, a, a researcher at uh, Arizona State University named Robert Cialdini, Bob, Bob Cialdini, wrote a book called um, Influence, The Science of Persuasion. And in that book, he reduces the idea down to six heuristic devices. And this is his more recent book, Persuasion, where he talks about how these billions of heuristic devices can really be brought down into six main factors that influence our decisions when we're not being influenced by the content of a message. Now, I'm sure that this all has gone over some of your heads, and that's fine. The first time I encountered this stuff, it went way over my head too. So to break down this complex series of hypotheses, we have a model, and you should be able to see that in my slides now. So the model just says, if there's persuasive communication, which there is, are you motivated to process that information? Um, do you think that it's personal to you? Um, do you need to understand it? Do you want to understand what's being said? If so, are you able to process it? Is it in a language that you understand, in an environment that's free of distractions? Is there enough repetition for you to comprehend the message? If so, then the nature of the cognitive process and the cognitive structural change take place, and you're taking a central route towards persuasion, okay? And that last part is kind of lumps together there because basically I want to focus today on something else. I want to focus on the peripheral cues. And these peripheral cues are things that exist outside of the message that encourage us to make an attitude change. All right, so um, let's take a look at where these heuristic devices come from. Now, as I said, Bob Cialdini, took all these lots of different ideas and he said, look, basically there are six things outside of message content that influence us when we are seeking or resisting compliance. And they are reciprocation, commitment and consistency, social proof, liking, authority, scarcity. So let's take a quick look at what each of these things mean. Reciprocity is probably not a word that you've heard before, but it's really simple. It just means if I do something for you, then you want to do something for me. Commitment and consistency means if I make a decision, I try to remain consistent with that decision. Social proof is the simplest of all because it just means you do what everyone else around you is doing. Liking means if you like someone, then you are likely to do what they ask. Authority is another simple one. Um, Cialdini shows that if someone is wearing a uniform, we are more likely to listen to what they tell us or to, to comply with their requests, whether or not the uniform has any significance whatsoever. And that's just as a side note, um, when I teach classes at LCC, I try to wear the uniform of a professor, uh, meaning I show up and wear a, a, a nice jacket that's kind of comfy and cozy. I try to give students the impression that I'm the sort of person who wants to hear what they have to say, but also that knows what I'm talking about and can have something to share or offer to deepen their thoughts and to deepen their ideas. That's a symbol or a traping of authority, but there are others that we'll talk about as well. Like for example, when I introduce myself to students, I often introduce myself as Dr. Jones. That simple trick of authority allows students to feel confident that what I'm telling them bears some authority. This is particularly useful when I'm giving them assignments. Okay, the last one is scarcity. And we'll talk about this one in more detail uh, in today's lesson. So I'm gonna save some of the details, but essentially it's how rare is something? The more rare something is, the more valuable we, per we perceive it to be. So we are more likely to be swayed or influenced by scarce resources. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail about all of these. Uh, we don't have time, and that's an entire semester long course that we teach at LCC called Persuasion and Propaganda. And in that course, we look at the distinctions between persuasion and the way that um, states use propaganda to control the participants in a given area. So today, we're only going to look at um, the compliance techniques, and we'll look at seeking and resisting compliance. And we'll look at that within the framework of persuasion. So 
The first question that I, I have for you, and this isn't a question I'm asking you to answer right now live in the chat, but rather one I want you to think about is how have you been exposed to these heuristic devices today? And I'll give you some examples. Reciprocation. How have you been exposed to reciprocation today? Well, one common way, if you were attending this event live and in person, we would probably have offered you some coffee, tea, sweets. And why do we do that? Well, it's not that we're trying to influence you in that broader sense of a, you know, unthinking compliance to the law, but rather that we're trying to create a favorable disposition. We like you and want you to like us. So we would do something that is hospitable. Now, you might think of this in terms of uh, a visit I recently had um, with, uh, with a friend. <clears throat> so we're in the same social bubble. And when I went to their house, uh, they laid out coffee and tea and sweets. And they said, ah, oh, we're so glad to have you. And when I came in, there was this greeting ritual. Well, they weren't trying to influence me unduly, but they were showing this little taste of hospitality. And what Cialdini found is that because we're so used to that being connected to um, the requests of friends and family, that larger corporations can also use reciprocity in order to gain our compliance when we're not thinking about it. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. And what about commitment and consistency? Now, here's one I know you've experienced because you're here with us today. And that is, did you register for this event? It's a simple thing, but we tend to be consistent with the commitments that we make. And there are things that we do that make those commitments even more um, powerful. And if you were taking the course, I would talk to you about how we can use compliance gaining techniques to persuade people to join our clubs or societies, and even to uh, help ourselves accomplish the work that we need to do for our courses or for our work after graduation. But for that, you'd have to come and take the class. Social proof. Who do you know here? It's likely that many of you are in this event, not just because you randomly saw it as you were scrolling through your social media feed one day, but that you know someone else who is in the audience with you. That is an example of social proof. Liking. Um, this is something that I really like the way it's been adapted into a social networked mediated world. And that is, we ask you to do things like to, to like our page or to like my account or to give me a thumbs up. Those sorts of activities, what they do is they put you in a positive frame of mind. That liking one thing allows you to like the larger network of things that it's connected with. Next, we have authority. And as I've already mentioned, uh, I introduced myself as Dr. Jones and uh, Vidmonte re referred to me through my title as an assistant professor here at LCC International University. And last is uh, scarcity. Now, those of you who are enrolled in the LCC Academy will have a chance to revisit this lecture at a later date, but there's a sense in which this is a scarce resource. It's one day only. Tonight, right now, the lecture is live. And if you miss it, you miss the live experience. Okay, so these are some ways you may have been exposed to these six heuristic devices already. And it's not to say that these things um, remove your ability to make a decision. It's just that these things are not about the message, the content, but they influence what decision you make. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about reciprocity. And I'll, I'll use the example that you can see here um, on my slide. <clears throat> this picture comes from the care packet that was pretty typical um, when I went to university, um, when I was an undergraduate student, what would happen is um, these different companies like uh, Procter & Gamble, for example, would put together a care packet of items that students would likely need and hadn't thought to pack when they went to university for the first time. What sorts of things were those? Well, you can see here, we have everything from deodorant to shampoo to on-the-go breakfast bars and some pledge wipes to clean your surfaces. All of these sorts of things are necessary, but uh, likely forgotten by students in their rush to get away. So what would happen is a company would give out these little samples for free, and then students would feel obligated to try out the sample. Now you might think that students would then think very deeply, is this a good product? Do I like it? Does it align with my values? 
Does the nature of the product that I'm using fit with the lifestyle I'm trying to pursue? For example, looking at this old picture through the lens of today, I see a lot of single-use products and a lot of single-use packaging, which is something that I would discourage any company from doing in the present day and age. But all that aside, what really happened was students said, myself included, wow, these people are great. They gave me free stuff. I want more of this. So what the rule of reciprocity says is we tend to ignore a message if we're, again, we're not thinking deeply about the message. We ignore the message and we look at reciprocity when someone gives us something, we think automatically that we should try to repay in kind what another person has given to us. And I want to explain here, this is just kind of a rule of getting along. You know, if your friend or neighbor gives you a helping hand, you should feel obligated to help them out in return. This is part of what it means to live in society. But reciprocity takes it a little bit further because it suggests, as Cellini argues, that there's this underlying drive within us to repay in kind what another person has given to us. So for example, uh, gifts, favors, even information creates this tiny sense of debt. And it's not a large debt, it's not an overwhelming debt. It's just a, a tiny little twinge that makes you go, huh, I should be nicer to that person. Reciprocity on a simple level then is really just receiving anything from a flyer when you walk into a grocery store. I'm not sure if any of you have had this experience, but when I went to the market for the first time, um, there was a really sweet seeming older woman, a, a babushka, and she cut a slice of apple and gave it to me to try. And I thought, what a sweet older woman who's giving me this slice of apple. And then I felt, I saw that next to her was a, a barrel of apples and I thought, oh, she's, she's selling the apples. I need to buy apples from her. I can't go look further into the market because she's already given me a slice of her apple and so I really should buy my apples from her. That tiny little moment is the moment of reciprocity that we're talking about. And it's likely that you don't think about this. It's likely that you don't realize it's happening. But free samples, whether it's from the babushka in the market or from a large corporation um, when you arrive at university for the first day, these kinds of free samples create a small sense of debt that we wish to repay. Okay, so what, what happens? Well, this is the seeking compliance, right? And how do you resist? Well, Cialini gives us some tips. First, he says, stop. <laughs> when someone offers you a free sample, whether it's um, a babushka in the market or it's a, a company that gives you a free sample, stop and ask yourself, why am I getting this? Is this something that um, I'm owed or, or deserve? Why is it that they are giving me this sample? After you've asked yourself that question, the next question to ask is, what obligation does it create? In other words, are they expecting me to try this apple and then buy the rest of the apples? Or is this someone who's very, for example, my grandfather had an orchard and was very proud of his apples and he never sold them. It was something that he kept mostly within the family. He would give samples of his apples to friends and relatives, family, and his joy was in sharing the apples of his bounty. It wasn't about creating an obligation. So if, it was coming from my grandfather, stop, why am I getting this? It's because my grandfather loves me. What obligation does it create? None really. In family relationships, we expect that the give and take um, happens all the time. Reciprocity isn't really incurred in a close uh, family relationship. But if it's someone who's trying to sell me something, then I really need to ask what obligation does it create? And then the last part here is, Am I willing to meet that obligation? Can I meet that obligation? Is it okay for me to do this thing? And if you can answer yes to that question, well, then there's not really much of a problem. You don't need to worry about it. Take the apple. You can buy the apples if you like the taste of it or not. It's up to you. What's challenging or scary is when that sense of obligation is created and you don't have a chance to think about whether you can live with the debt or not. Cialdini gives a fascinating example um, that's more connected to commitment and consistency, but I'll, I'll tell it here. Um, he said that 
they wanted people in a neighborhood to put up a sign in their front yard. And the sign was kind of big and honestly, it was pretty ugly. So what they did was they went around to the neighborhood and they asked people whose houses they wanted to put the sign in front of if they would put a tiny sign in their window. And the most people said, sure, happy to do it. Not a big deal. I can put up the sign in my window. And then a few weeks later, they returned to the people who had the signs in their windows and said, hey, we noticed that you have the sign in your window. Would you mind putting up a larger sign in your yard? Now, this was the ugly sign. And what they found is that most people said, sure, you can put a giant ugly sign up in my yard. The whole idea here was that the, the gift of the small sign initially created a sense of reciprocity. So having received a small gift, they were willing to take on the debt of a larger obligation, putting up the ugly sign. Now, it's also, as I mentioned, commitment and consistency, but to better understand how that works, you'd have to take the class. So moving along then from reciprocity, um, I wanted to go back to that model. And I think this model does a pretty good, I, pretty good job of uh, sort of simplifying what's happening. Okay, so hopefully I have my pointer turned on. You receive a message. And the first question is, are you motivated to process the message? That is, are you motivated to think about it? Usually not. If someone gives you a slice of apple, you're usually just like, ah, free apple, great. The next question is, are you, and sorry, I should say, so you don't process it, you go over here to the heuristic cue. Is a heuristic cue present? Well, yeah, they just gave me an apple. So I comply with the request, which is buy some apples. Okay, but let's say I'm motivated to process. I go through the steps and I say, wait a minute, why am I getting this apple? What obligation does it create? Am I willing to meet that obligation? Well, now I'm, I'm processing the message, right? And that message is uh, buy my apples. <laughs> and now I'm able to process that message. So there's not too many distractions. I understand what the person is saying to me. I process the message and then I comply or I don't based on the, the content of the message. But there's something else that happens here too. So let's say I'm motivated to process the message and I'm thinking about it, are these good apples? Do I like the apples? And I don't understand what the woman is saying to me. She's giving me a basket of apples and I'm saying to myself, why are you handing these apples to me? If I don't understand what she's saying, but I've received the free sample of apple, then the heuristic cue is present and I'm very strongly likely to comply. That is, I'm likely to hand over a fistful of euros to buy those apples. And I'll give you a, a slightly um, different example of this, still to do with apples. I do love apples. Uh, when I visited Kiev a few years ago, I um, stopped by a, a grocery stand and I didn't yet understand the conversion rates. And someone had um, a, a, a pile of apples, a little pyramid of apples. And uh, I was, I had just arrived. I was pretty hungry. I thought I'll, 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 I'll take an apple. Um, and uh, I was motivated to process. So um, she gave me a slice of the apple. It was delicious. I thought, yes, I'll, I'll take this. Um, but then um, I didn't understand what she was saying to me and just handed her a fistful of hryvnia. It turns out I was trying to purchase a kilogram of apples instead of a single apple. <laughs> It's a moment that stuck with me, but it illustrates this idea of the inability to process and how that influences compliance. I had no idea what was going on in this transaction, but there was a heuristic cue present, which is that she had given me a sample of the apple at first, and so I was willing to pay whatever she had written down on the little sign in order to comply with her request of buying apples from her that day. All right, we'll move on then to our next example, which is scarcity. This is a picture. Um, you may have seen some um, more recent pictures, though not in 2020 or 2021, of Black Friday. Black Friday is a sales day in the United States when stores try to compete with each other by offering really good deals on things, products. And people will mob the store in order to get something to be the first. If you're a gamer, you may have experienced something similar with the recent launch of uh, the new PlayStation platform. <laughs> I was talking to a few former students who expressed annoyance at the inability to get the latest PlayStation platform. Also, you might have seen some of this um, in regards to um, trying to get uh, vaccines um, around the world. This is another example where scarcity is a strong influencing factor. So, 
Scarcity works like this. We don't want to miss out. We as human beings are just wired that way. We hate the idea that we've missed an opportunity. So if there's limited time or a limited number of something, then it strongly influences us to comply with the request to acquire it. So if you find yourself in a situation where, um, for example, there's a limited time sale, then the best way to resist that compliance gaining technique is to stop again and ask yourself, are you feeling anxious? And then you walk away to determine um, just how far uh, away you can get. And then you ask yourself, what need does this thing fulfill? Okay, I need to go through and explain these a little bit more. The way that the scarcity principle works is that when you are presented with the idea that there are only a couple of something, um, there's only a few socks for sale at your local uh, clothing store, then you have an overwhelming desire to get those socks, no matter how much they cost, you need those socks. Or perhaps to give a more realistic example, um, there's only five PlayStation 5s for sale in the local electronics shop and you really want one. Why do you want one? Well, in part, you want one um, because there's a limited number. You wanna be one of the first and you're willing to pay more for it because there's not too many for you to get. So it creates a sense of anxiety. And that's why Cialdini says you need to stop and ask yourself, am I feeling anxious? If you are feeling anxious, that's a sign that there's something else going on. You're, you're not processing the message here. You're following the heuristic cue. Then walk away. If you can walk away from something, then that helps you say like, okay, I, I don't need to make this decision right now. I can wait five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And if the deal is still there, then you can reconsider it in a calmer frame of mind. And then the last is that Cialdini is kind of saying, do you really need that? This is something that a student really convicted me of when she was um, doing her research project on sustainability and the ecological impact we have on the environment around us. She was talking about living a zero waste lifestyle and it really came back to asking yourself a lot of questions about what need does this item, object, thing fulfill? And if you can't name it, then it might be that you don't actually need it. Okay, so how does this work? Well, you receive the message. Are you motivated to process? If yes, are you able to process? If yes, then you'll process and lead, this leads to compliance. If you're not motivated to process though, then you ask yourself, have you been told that there's a limited time or a limited number? If so, then that heuristic cue is going to lead you towards compliance. And it's not that you can't resist, but that in order to resist, you have to stop and ask yourself, am I feeling anxious? Walk away and then ask yourself after you've walked away, given some time, some distance, what need does this thing fulfill in my life? So um, <laughs> those of you who are enrolled in the uh, LCC Academy, are going to come to understand what the slap shop is in the follow-up to the lecture for today. Um, but for the rest of you, I'm just going to talk through these uh, six persuasive heuristics again. So today we've talked about overall how we are led towards compliance. That persuasion is this thing that happens to us either through the content of a message. And if you're a student of mine at LCC, I, I try to teach you how to make really good contentful messages. But in the absence of people really digging into the content of message, we pay attention to heuristic cues. There were a lot of heuristic cues that we have identified, but Cialdini says they can be generally organized into six fundamental principles. Reciprocity, commitment and consistency, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. We dug a little deeper into two of these. We talked about reciprocity, so the example of free samples and how free samples lead us towards making a decision. And we also talked about scarcity, how the perception that there's a limited time or a limited number overrides our better judgment and leads us into compliance. In the context of persuasion, 
I can tell you, um, and if we were doing this in a smaller classroom setting, I would ask you for examples and help you understand ways that these heuristic devices are used all the time in every interaction that you have without your being conscious of it. For here, for now, I'm going to leave a lot of that exampling to the follow-up, which you'll be able to see in the LCC Academy Google um, Classroom. And instead, I just want to remind you that these heuristic devices are all things that happen when you're not paying attention to the content of a message. When we talk about the elaboration likelihood model, elaboration just means thinking deeply, really processing, using your brain's power to understand what you've been given or what message is coming in through your ears. So for all of you, this is my encouragement to process the messages you receive. Think deeply about the content. One of the things I really like about being here at LCC is the opportunity to work closely with students in areas of their passion. Um, recently, I've been able to work with a group of students who started a club called the Listen First Club. And if you were participating in the International Public Speaking Competition this year, you'll notice that there's some overlap between listening and persuasion, um, or at least that I'm involved in both of those activities. The Listen First Club is really an opportunity for students to talk about how do we centrally process messages that we receive from the world around us. I've been excited to hear how students have taken some simple ideas from classes that we've discussed and blown them up by talking about them with their friends and shown where they excel. So um, with that, I, my uh, lecture for today is at an end. So I'm going to uh, exit and stop sharing my screen and then I'll give it back to Vidmante if we have some questions that have come in. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And uh, yes, we have a few questions. I would just, I would like to, others to encourage if you have any question, uh, you can uh, connect to sludo.com and enter the code and you can find the code in, uh, in the chat, uh, live chat box. And yes, we do have um, a question. Mm -hmm. I now can uh, share my screen. Um, just give me a second. Yeah. So, so we have a question from Paulina. And uh, uh, Andrew, you, at the end, you actually gave us the, the suggestion and advice. And Paulina is saying, maybe you can add something to, to her question. So Paulina is saying, knowing, understanding, and realizing all the manipulations that people use, what do you, what do you personally do? Uh, not paying attention, or do you remember who did what? And yes, as being you know, a professional in all of these things that, uh, that you mentioned, um, how do you personally react when you notice and observe those kind of tools uh, you, being used in around you in your own environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I like this idea of, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you that um, one of my mentors said, we study things that we don't understand and we specialize in things that we don't do well. <laughs> so when I read Bob Cialdini's work, uh, he's written several books now. One of the things that I love is in almost every introduction he says, I am telling you this because it trips me up every day. <laughs> so um, am I an expert at resisting compliance? No, but I think that the real technique or tool or the thing that I would want you to come away with is by paying better attention, you become more aware and you train yourself to be more resistant to um, attempts at manipulation. And I wanna draw a distinction here which is between what I would call uh, persuasion and what I would call manipulation. Persuasion is all about making more choices available. So when I am um, in a situation where someone is trying to persuade me, I, I love that they're trying to give me more options than I thought of on my own. Oftentimes, for example, when I'm talking with students um, <laughs> and we're talking about an assignment, for example, I've got it in my head when the assignment is due. I love it when students of mine come to me, and there may be some students in the crowd, so this I'm setting myself up for something, but when students come to me and they say, uh, Dr. Jones, you've said the assignment is due on Wednesday, but what if the assignment is due on Friday? 
That kind of persuasion, and um, I insist that they be a little bit more persuasive than that, but that kind of persuasion is an attempt to multiply the possibilities. I'd only been thinking about the assignment due on Wednesday, and the student says, well, what if it's due on Friday? Now we have an opportunity to see the world in a different way. What if the assignment is due on Friday? Well, now that's an opportunity of persuasion. Manipulation, though, is all about limiting our opportunities. It's trying to take options off the table. So when I am presented with a new possibility, I think that's a great thing. It's when someone else is trying to prevent me from seeing all of the available opportunities that I start to get a little frustrated. And what do you do in that case? Well, Cialdini's first step is always to stop. So it's always to try and move from the outside, that kind of heuristic processing, is there something outside that's influencing me, to the central route, to really thinking about the message. Is this something that's good for me and good for society? So when we're faced with this conundrum, right, um, do we simply not pay attention to messages? No, because not paying attention slides you over into that heuristic processing frame, and all of a sudden, you just start automatically complying with everything that comes at you. So it's really important not to not pay attention, but to actually pay more attention, because the more attention you pay, the better your processing will be. It's not possible, though, to completely eliminate heuristic devices. They're all around you, and they exist because they make decision-making easier. So um, I really like that question because I think you're getting at the heart of this distinction between persuasion, which is opening up options, and manipulation, which is trying to eliminate choices. Um, <laughs> am I sticking to all the rules that we were told today? Uh, not all of them, but I do use these techniques because they're helpful. Why are they helpful? Well, they're helpful because um, I think if you listen to the content of the message that you'll be swayed. But I know that you're, you're busy. Um, there's a lot of other stuff competing for your attention right now and every day in your life. So these heuristic cues are ways to give you a shortcut to making what I believe would be a good decision. And I want to emphasize here that this is where the ethics of the persuader become so important. Um, students at LCC are required to take courses in ethics. Uh, communication ethics is one of our senior capstone courses. Um, there is a university-wide course as part of our curriculum that all students take on uh, morality and, and decision-making in terms of their ethical lives. And that's because we believe that we're training you to be communicators, but we want you to be ethical communicators. So is it unethical for a company to give out a free sample? No, absolutely not. That's part of the way that they're doing business. And in that doing business, it's they're giving you the sample because they believe their product is good and they want you to continue buying from them. However, it is important to follow that um, overall idea of stopping, pausing, taking a moment to consider deeply. Okay, um, we can move on to uh, Nazar's question. What if you cannot resist such an attractive proposition? What if it is so alluring that you will be worrying the rest of your life for missing it? That's the principle of scarcity. And scarcity shows up in our lives all the time. The reason it works is because there really are things that come around once in a lifetime. An attractive proposition that you shouldn't turn down or shouldn't walk away from. The trick is knowing when it's an attractive proposition because it really is good. And I think that's what Cialdini's technique is getting towards. If you stop, if you ask yourself, am I feeling anxious? If you walk away for a moment to give yourself some distance, physically, emotionally, mentally from the offer, then you can ask yourself that third question, what need does it fill? If the proposition is attractive only because um, it's an attractive proposition, then it's not filling a need and you'll likely be okay with missing it. You probably won't regret it for the rest of your life. If you do though, there's a, a communication theory that will help um, solve that problem for you. Um, and it, it comes from um, Leon Festinger, it's the cognitive dissonance model. And we, we talk about it in communication theory. Uh, if you're curious, um, I, there are some ways to follow up and um, I'm, I'm sure that someone will be able to point you towards cognitive distance. Okay, well, I guess uh, um, questions are coming in, that's great. Uh, I think we have some time to answer one or two questions and uh, maybe you can, um, Andrew, pick the questions that uh, I, I think that we won't have time to answer 
uh, all of the questions unless you know we can combine them but then you can pick and re enter the, the questions that you think that you can answer sure. all right uh let's see um I really like the, this last question. Uh, if we talk about marketing, can we insist that marketing is based on, um, on persuasion? So uh, marketing um, uses tools of persuasion and it uses a lot of tools of persuasion. In fact, some of our students have gone on to work for marketing, both in social media marketing, as well as uh, marketing in the larger scale companies. Um, and I, I think that they get a lot out of the classes that they take here from media culture in a digital age where they understand social media marketing to um, persuasion and propaganda where they understand the, the nature of persuasion. So is marketing based on persuasion? Yeah, a lot of the times it is. One thing that I find kind of interesting is the overlap between marketing and something called public relations. Public relations comes as a field after uh, the 1950s, and the, the father of public relations in the United States actually wrote a book called Propaganda. And in that book, he outlines the way that heuristic devices and cues influence people towards making decisions. So it's important to understand that he's using propaganda in an ancient way, um, not that ancient, but a little older way, uh, in reference to propagating the truth. How do you share the truth to the widest possible audience? And I think that the, the disconnect or the, the struggle that we have here is when we are thinking about marketing um, and we're thinking about how persuasion is being used, we really need to think about our responsibility as ethical communicators and our um, opportunity to be thoughtful consumers. So ethical communicators think about the impact of their communication beyond the immediate. It's not making a sale right now today, it's what impact does my product have on the life of my customers for years, decades, centuries to come? And then the ethical consumers of communication, that's, that's all of us, is the, the obligation to stop and to consider the message we've received. Is this really good for me? Is this something that, that I um, am able to participate in? And so, um, when we're thinking about this, I, I like that it comes down, I like that it combines, I think, with this idea of um, being a critical thinker. And being a critical thinker means being the sort of person who takes time to understand messages. And I think that that's really when we're talking about like that central route processing, that's what it means to be a critical thinker. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And uh, we want to be uh, respectful to uh, your time and to those who are watching us. Um, yes, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us. We are able to help you out to answer the questions about the university. If you have any questions to the professor and you want to learn more about the uh, communication program, you can also email us and then we will uh, forward these uh, questions to uh, our professor Andrew Jones and thank you Andrew for uh, sharing your knowledge your expertise you're always um, such a help for uh, the admissions office and the recruitment and uh, you always are there for the prospective students and um, thank you for those who um, watched us uh, listen the lecture and we will see you um, next time.